while established companies panic over the the day-to-day, there's someone out there who's taking bolder and bigger risks. My name is Yaniv Korem. I'm here to study successful innovation professionals and uncover the mindset and models they use to de-risk the future. On this podcast, I invite fellow professors, practitioners, and entrepreneurs to have an honest conversation about the business of innovation. No more bullshit. We talk openly and honestly about what works and what doesn't. So come on, get your ass in that seat. School's about to start. Hey, bud. Welcome to the show. Hello. Glad glad to be here. Cool. So maybe uh, let's start with a bit of context. Um, You founded Nobel, spelled N-O-B-L. Could you explain what is Nobel? Yeah, let me let me take you back uh, in time a little bit. I am a recovering software developer, never a good one. Um, and then I fell into sort of innovation consulting and was an innovation consultant for companies like Pepsi, GE, Amex. I helped build a lot of innovation labs and prototypes and pitch decks and oh my God, oh my. And then sometime around 2008, 2009, I looked at my success rate and it was abysmal. Like the so few of the ideas that I had put on paper or created in prototype or even got to initial testing stages really existed in the world. And I realized that I was solving the wrong problem, that I wasn't solving the culture and people problem inside organizations. So I left the innovation world behind and started Nobel. And we really think of ourselves as a culture and change agency. And so, you know, the epiphany I I always tell people about is that organizations aren't suffering from a lack of ideas. They're suffering from ways of working and cultures that kill good ideas from the people who work there. Exactly. Exactly. So the first time I came across uh, Nobel and your work was through this beautiful, beautiful article that you wrote um, titled. It it is. It really is. And and I've said this before on a previous um, conversation. It also has like one of the sexiest diagrams I've ever seen. So, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm hooked. I was hooked. Um, so the, the article for our listeners um, is called What Every Institutional Innovation Program Gets Wrong, and I will link it in the show notes. But I was wondering if you could kind of give the gist of it, you know, distill the main idea for those who haven't read it. Yeah, it was in response way back when, um, when Google X, which was sort of the the most experimental arm of Google, was actually dismantling itself and thinking about what worked and what didn't work. And so much of that story about they created all of these incredibly innovative ideas and projects in the world, but really failed to scale those ideas and especially failed to scale them back into the mothership. And so much of that um, <laughs> felt like Uh, PTSD from my time as an innovation consultant, where you have a great idea, a great business case that you validated, and it's like dropping a seed on a linoleum floor. Um, You can't expect it to sprout. So, and we were working with a couple of clients at the time, trying to do innovation differently inside their organizations. And what, what dawned on me, and it's, it's really obvious in retrospect is just innovation is, is a baton race. Um, it's a relay race between sort of, you know, the people who live at the edge who you want to experiment with things that can't scale yet, that don't have a, a business model yet behind them, that are just exploring wholly new ideas and diffusing new technologies. But then you have the other side of the organization, which is optimizing what you did yesterday. So how do we keep the lights on for cheaper? And there's this enormous canyon between those two teams. And the realization that we were going through with a few of our clients and and is articulated in the piece is that there's this missing scale team and function that really is the baton handoff between your lab that probably exists in Silicon Valley or far away from headquarters, and then the day-to-day product managers and general managers in the organization. There, There needs to be a team whose job it is to scale innovation both commercially and internally. They need to be your best entrepreneurs. They need to also understand how to integrate with your existing systems. And it's just this this complete absence in most organizations. And that's why you get a lot of um, 
you know, not invented here reactions from VPs when innovation teams try to hand over work. That's why there's such a, a cliff um, between new ideas and then seeing those ideas in the real in the real world as part of like the prod the company's portfolio. Yeah. Right. 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 And in the piece, you say, um, I'm, I'm going to try and quote you here. Uh, as a large institution, you need an innovation lab. And um, I, I find that super interesting. Mm -hmm. Does that still hold true today? And uh, I'm also wondering what you mean by innovation lab. Like if yeah. you can expand on I mean, it's somewhat dated that when we think about innovation labs, even from like 10 years ago, we picture, um, you know, uh, like a space in San Francisco or in the Valley um, with lots of random technology. We often picture a physical space, right? Um, which is far less, especially in times of COVID, of what we're really talking about now. But you do need a dedicated team who is looking three to five years out in terms of possibility, because especially for public companies, they're just so obsessed, not even on the quarter, but I'm talking about on the day. Um, you need a special group of people who are freed up to think truly about the future and about who can disrupt you, about new technologies that can make consumers' lives easier and better. Um, you, you absolutely need a team, and that team can now be dispersed. There's so many tools that can allow that to happen. But you need resources behind that. That's the other thing so often in organizations we find is that you'll you'll hear innovation spoken about uh, nonstop. You'll even read it in annual reports, but there are no resources behind it. So it's a completely unfunded mandate. That's madness, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's absolutely insane. That or, you know, let's be totally honest, innovation's often a holding pen that organizations send weirdos to, to sort of send them out to <laughs> pasture. Um, exactly. And, then, and it's like a year later they've moved on because there was like no career progression, no impact or anything. Yeah, exactly. Like I keep um, um, remembering that CB insights quote, um, um, you know, someone stuck in their career, give them innovation. I think it was <sighs> something along those lines. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, so you're saying that you need that third team, the scalers. Um, I keep coming back. You talked about exploration and uh, optimization, and I like that you use the word optimization and not exploitation because I'm, I keep thinking about that paper by March, right? Exploration, exploitation, and organizational uh, learning. Yeah. Um, so why do you think they're missing that that third piece? Like, why does that happen? I think it's it, it was a funny revelation to me because before I started doing corporate innovation, I worked at a lot of startups and almost every one of the startups I worked for failed to scale. Um, and so often scaling is the, is the absolute hardest part of any new venture, yet corporations seem to think because they're innovating within their own walls that they are protected from the challenges of scale. I mean, scaling everything from trying to find a viable business model to integrating with systems to, you know, finding more than your first five customers to, you know, just so many things that can stop just from scale in the external world. And then internally, it's just inertia, it's politics, it's incentives, it's organizational structures. And yeah, I think organizations just, just convince themselves they were insulated from those challenges. Meanwhile, you know, at least one person's uh, data uh, point, like our, my success rate and the success rate of the firms I was working for were so, so small because they really like, we had great ideas on paper. I mean, we, you know, we, we worked on projects where the CEO would give a rallying speech internally that this was going to be their next huge innovation. We would we literally looked at buying a factory in China to start to mass produce this new device for the company. And then within three weeks, it had completely fallen apart because um, the head of stores would have to give up retail space for it. The head of marketing would have to give up some of his holiday budget to cover uh, promoting it, which he didn't want to do. And, and, and all these people were not incentivized to to actually promote innovation. And I get it. And that wasn't in their yearly goals, 
but it was just like it was like one uh one loss too many at the time and that's when i realized i was solving the wrong problems yeah absolutely do you think that these uh scalers i'm trying to think like what would be um you know kind of the uh the the characteristics that defines them like yeah. what what would you look for uh if you had to put together a team of scalers so when we do this normally and in a lot of the companies we work for because we work with a lot of the fortune 500 they have some kind of innovation function so when we start to think about okay how do you broaden what's the next stage out from that we think about one just bringing across sort of like the technical product manager of the product because they understand actually how it works. But then we need someone who can bridge the gap between um, the the organization's main systems, technical systems to be able to help scale that to like be. And then also really, I said it before, and, you know, it's a term no one loves, but entrepreneurs, like they've got to be able to play the political game um, and, and curry favor. Like one of the, <laughs> I get asked a lot, like, you know, what trainings do innovation teams need? And people so often go design thinking. And I'm, my first instinct is always persuasion and negotiation. Um, like, unless you actually, you know, like, um, I forget the exact title of the book, but like getting to yes is like actually a much more important book to read than like learning double diamond. Um, I absolutely because, agree. Yeah. You've got to be able to sit in a conference room with someone who has short term goals and incentives has more projects on their backlog than they can actually execute has a matrixed organization. So they have three bosses breathing down their neck and you have to convince them why this new innovation isn't just shiny and new, but also will meet their goals and will fulfill what they need and what you need. Yeah. Plus the risk, like you're asking people to take uh, on a lot of risk and, you know, most corporates, they don't like risk. So your your job is even harder, right? Yeah. I mean, everything about the modern organization is about reducing risk. And, you know, I, I'm, bureaucracy is such a bad term, but like it was created so we could mitigate risk and we could balance decision making. But um, the beast has grown at this at this point. And uh, yeah, you've got, and, and you can try to dismantle it. A lot of our work at Nobel is trying to what we get, what we call getting to like minimal viable bureaucracy uh, inside organizations. But you also just, you know, you have to have those folks internally that can navigate those relationships, navigate those pol those political waters, because innovation so often is um, innovation by miracle <laughs> inside an organization. Um, and you've got to, you've got to be better than luck. Right, right. More than 50, 50 chance. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or more. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah to 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 yeah to either side i guess like either fail or succeed but like don't don't hang in the balance of like pure luck well the worst thing i mean like innovation should fail for lots of reasons right but the reason why it shouldn't fail is because of an internal politicking right like the market should beat the shit out of you um the users should you know come to hate you if you if you build a really bad product but the idea that you know i, I i'll share an example um, we were working with a client and we were trying to convince them to turn their like most boring advertising over to machine learning. Um, yeah, we're like, you know, like these are banner ads. Let's, 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 let's let machine learning compare and contrast like 70,000 different assets to find like the highest performing unit for these sites. Um, we dressed the room and all the permutations that were generated, um, and we started to show them what, what was already early, um, uh, like early winners on certain on certain sites. And the client came in the room, listened for about 10 minutes and turned to us and said, but I like blue cars. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even though Good. the algorithm Cut showed the it, action. Like, yeah. And it was just it was just like throw out the entire thing. And it and it was one of those moments where it's like, well, I'm, I can't debate you because you're not a rational person. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yes. yeah, yeah, you are not someone who should be interfacing with innovation. Yeah, that's a, that's well. I mean, you know, it's not surprising. Like most of the decisions that get made, I don't know. At least from my experience, are, they feel like that. Like you know, you stick your like your thumb in your mouth and hold it up, and yeah, this like that way. We're going that way. Uh, it, it a lot of times it just feels like that. 
Yeah. Well, I think, I don't know. I think that's somewhat the holdover of uh, the cult of Steve Jobs, which mm. was like one man, often one white man <laughs> can know the future and no one else can. And, and like, meanwhile, they did lots of user testing. It was a very big team that had lots of debate and, and, and dissent and things like that. But when we think when, this, when the story comes out, it's, well, it's just a story. Yeah, it's it's how they spun it, right? It just it makes for a better story. Like, who wants to hear about all the hard work that they went through, and you know, me, uh, a I lot of data. That. I love those stories. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I mean, that's why I only watch shows about like high performing teams that struggle. That's like the only <laughs> things I watch: Star Trek, West Wing. I love all. I love all that shit. There you go. There you go. So, um, you know, this is a challenge because we're on audio, but I want to I want to talk about the diagram, uh, a.k.a. the sexy diagram, um, which uh, you call it's the model, right? It's the model and you call it the flywheel flywheel. And yes. And to me, it resembles like a a bicycle transmission. Uh, You got the big wheel, the small wheel and kind of the chain that links them together tra- transmits the energy right yeah. um but i don't know if you planned it this way but it seems like it's going so from left to right you've got the small wheel it's the explore theme you got the chain or the middle which is the scale team and then the big wheel is the optimized it's like the core business yeah. and this idea or innovation it goes from left to right from explore through scale to optimize but it only goes one way yeah uh, is that intentional can it work the other way i think you know i think it's possible but i often think about product development as this uh, endless treadmill from um, from being brilliant to boring you know, and and I think every every product in the world has a shelf life. Um, you know, that doesn't mean they all have to completely die, but there's this, um, there's you know, and it reminds me of the Clay Shirky quote of technology only becomes interesting when it becomes boring. So, so there's a moment like explore teams should be exploring the very edges of what's feasible um, in the world with with emerging technology, but those you can't really do a lot with it. I mean, they, they usually make a cool presentation, but it's not it's not a commercial viability yet. And so then it needs to be handed over to a scale team who can really figure out its its viability um, and even its desirability. I mean, explore teams shouldn't completely divorce themselves from consumer de- or user desirability, but um, depending on what category you're in, sometimes you just need pure R and D for exploration, and then it hands over to that scale team whose re- whose job is, is is to assess is this a true commercial opportunity for the business, and to pursue it long enough until it can then fold into the optimized core of the business. Which, you know, honestly, the challenge there is like let it c- keep sustaining that product until the cost of defending it is no longer sustainable. Right. That's what I that's what I think of. And sometimes like oftentimes in your product portfolio, you have product literally there just for defense. Right. Like we're just we're we're just sort of propping this up still so that we we stop competition from coming in. But you have to have, again, innovations in the pipeline. Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So those are the uh, what you call the exit thresholds, like. Yeah. Right out of every every stage, the explore has the MVP and the scale has the proven economics, and then the optimize has the uh, what you call the termination threshold of unsustainable economics. So when it no longer is uh, uh, creating the value that it was uh, intended to. Right. Right. And you know, and the explore team or explore phase, like we we love measuring just like rate of failure. Like rate of failure should be really high. You should be trying a lot of things. You shouldn't be committed to, um, you know, just a single concept. Explore team or scale team is really about, you know, I, I now these days I'm really more fascinated with how like interconnected they are to the rest of the organization. Um, you know, the, I I don't want them to be an island of misfit toys. I want them to be hyper connectors inside the organization. I want them to be hyper influencers. And then, you know, the explore team is, you know, is basic like CPG. How do I, how do I maintain the health and viability of this product over a long time? And how do I, 
how do I find ways to decrease costs and maintain quality or even like slightly uptick quality? Sometimes I can, you know, to your point of, does it always have to go from innovation all the way to optimization? Can it sometimes go the other way? Sometimes you can find new technologies that you can diffuse into old products to keep them alive for somewhat longer. Um, I think about like, I think about when uh, motors became small enough that you can install them in razors and suddenly you could add like a tiny motor to your standard razor. And I don't know what benefit that provides, but it provides like talk value, I suppose. So um, you can, you know, sometimes you can keep an old product alive with a diffusion of a new, a new technology or a new trend. Right. I want to, I want to challenge you though, about something that you said about the, um, Ooh, do it. the, the, <laughs> the explore team, because you were saying, uh, something to the extent of like measuring the, the failure rate and they should be failing, you know, like, like crazy. Uh, is that really, really so? I mean, it, it, it sounds or feels a little like, you know, the, uh, the, the Steve Jobs story. It's like, it's a good story, mm. but does it really happen? Because the people in the Explore are sometimes just as afraid of failure as like they sort of adopt, I guess, the, the culture of the organization. Some, somehow, somewhere it permeates, yeah. you know, and then, and then they no longer want to fail. Yeah, and I'm dating myself a little bit because my days as like a peer innovation consultant was probably seven, eight years ago. And we still talked about failure a lot. And now it's not as uh, it's, it's it's cooler to talk about learning. Like we fail to learn. <laughs> um, I don't know. I actually made products and, and I failed a lot. And I failed stupidly and amazingly and lots of other things. I think I can usually, if you show me the portfolio of your innovation team, I can usually tell you how knitted they are to the rest of the organization and, and how, how, how too connected they are, right? Like we're, I'm working with a client right now who had an innovation function um, and then they shook the etch a sketch and decided to embed those innovation uh, resources inside the brands themselves. And suddenly all of that exploration from like a three to five year time horizon, like dramatically slammed down to one year. Um, and so it was no longer about really future proofing the business. It was, they were almost just like hired hands. Yeah. So, so there is a, is there, is there like a, is there like a right relationship or a right distance or a right gap between those two functions or? If you... it's, it's a good question. Like there was, um, you know, it, my, my, one of my white whales is it was like years ago, I found a study that showed that like the success rate of an innovation team could be correlated to the geographic distance from the headquarters of an organization. Wow. Uh, okay. And I've been trying to track down That's that article cool. ever since. <laughs> um, um, that, but that requires you to really have this scale team, though, because if you're only like 500 miles away from headquarters, you really will suffer the, like, the drop baton. But if you do have that scale team that can be that, that tether between the two, that is really successful. Um, you know, and... It's just, it's, it's especially in a time like this. So we're talking together, right? Like at the, at, at maybe the dip of the first uh, part of COVID here in the U S maybe there's a second wave. We have a lot of companies who are in like either free fall or panic, even companies that seem to be doing well in some categories are still hyper concerned about, about, you know, the day to day and the stock market makes no sense whatsoever. And so I'm seeing across our clients, a lot of like bringing innovation closer and closer and people over gripping on it. And I see what could have been long-term opportunities for organizations become sort of like immediate short-term gains. And I'm seeing people who would have sat on that explore team, whose job it was to think about really the future of the organization and in, in a defensive and offensive way, now just fulfilling, you know, uh, secondary roles on teams. And I, and I think I, I you know, I, there's going to be a bounce back at some point and I think it's going to be costly. And that's why in every recession or in every moment like this, disruptors come out because while established companies panic over the day to day, there's someone out there who's taking bolder and bigger risks. 
on a on, on a shoestring budget in comparison as well. Right, right, exactly. So this this article, um, it was born out of experience, right? Working with yeah. your clients. Did you then, after you wrote it, did you implement it? Um, and what were some of the the learnings? Yeah, we've done. We've built a few a few scale teams. I mean, I wrote that the moment we were building a couple. We've done a, a few after. You know, I, I would say what's working, what hasn't. Um, we had to get smarter and smarter about who we dedicated to that scale team. Now I often ask the question of who is a cultural influencer, who's been with the company, who can, who has made the impossible happen in the company, and those questions help us figure out who's the right sort of lead for that role. Again, a, a, a bigger focus on persuasion and negotiation is something that we've learned. Um, but, you know, we've still suffered like the same uh, the same things that all innovation teams suffer. I mean, we've we've built innovation teams that have gone and won, uh, you know, lots of press and have earned millions of dollars for, for organizations. And then a new CTO will be hired and they'll completely shake the Etch-A-Sketch and start over again. Um, it's just there's, you know, in a, Innovation has that problem in most organizations that it is sexy. It's either it's either the pasture that you put the weirdos out to, or it's where people think they're going to make their name. And both of those are problematic in terms of like the projects that are literally in the pipeline. But I mean, we've had we've had pretty big successes at the same time, and that model has has held up pretty well. Um, and I think what's actually more interesting to me is I think that article it's probably like three or four years old now. Um, And really in the last like six to 12 months has the attention actually uh, been applied to it. Like HBR picked it up um, and we've been having conversations like this and more clients have, have, have been reaching out because I think they're, I think, you know, again, I was early as the innovation guy for a lot of companies we were on like the first swing of building those innovation labs years ago. Um, you know, around more digital technologies, I'll say there's certainly labs that existed before that. Um, but Xerox Park, one of my favorite places on the planet to walk around in. If, if people don't know that story, I mean, that is like the definitive example of a group of people who were tasked with imagining the future and then it went nowhere. And Steve Jobs and Bill Gates showed up and stole everything, um, which which is amazing to me. Um but lately, yeah, that that article has been getting more and more attention and more relevance because I think organizations are starting to see that there that there is a you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be our solution, which is like an entirely new team and set of resources. But they are realizing there is this drop baton between new ideas and new technologies and implementing the day to day business. Fantastic. Um, but just before we wrap up, if People want to learn more. Obviously, I'm going to link the article in the show notes and uh, all our listeners should just go and read it. Um, how can they learn more about you? How can they learn more about Nobel? Yeah, so great. I appreciate the question. Appreciate the links. Um, you can visit our website. It's nobl.io. And then if you click the resources tab, we have a site called Academy, which is where we kind of we publish everything we learn. Um, we've always had this, this idea as an organization that you either like outspend or you out teach uh, your competitors. And, um, also it's like the best onboarding tool for every new hire we have, just like, go read the, go read our greatest hits. Um, it's, it's free. It's open. A lot of our IPs just free, freely available. Um, yeah. And, and we're working to even scale that even further. Like we're working on a project right now to try to, to take, like management as an idea from an oral tradition to an actual craft, um, which is a whole other project called Work Hub that we'll talk about sometime, someday later on another podcast. On the next podcast. Yeah, let's leave something for uh, for the next one. I, yeah. I'm i so glad that you put up Academy because it has so many great resources and I often go back to it. Um, so really, thank you for that. Well, it's very kind to have me. Thank you so much. Thank you for being on the show. Yeah.